Good evening, good evening, good evening, y'all. It is Wednesday at 8 p.m. It's Bible study, y'all. Uh, we want to welcome everyone in on this evening for our weekly Bible study. For our weekly Bible study, we'll give a few minutes for people to join us this evening. Um, but before we jump into our Bible study, just want to say how great it was on this past Sunday to be worshiping uh, with one another in person, y'all, for Mother's Day. You know, the fellas really worked hard uh, to honor uh, our ladies, our mothers, uh, both in service uh, as well as after service, uh, as well with brunch and roses and pictures and things like that. So I just want to give the fellas kudos, kudos, and mothers uh, continued happy Mother's Day. Thank you for your sacrifice, for your love, for your children, for our children, for everything that you do uh, as well. It was so good to see everybody in person as, as always. We announced on this past Sunday as well that we are shifting our monthly uh, worship rhythm, right? So typically we had been worshiping every first Sunday uh, of the month and then virtually the remaining uh, Sundays. Uh, but we announced on this past Sunday that we are shifting now and we are uh, going to more frequent in-person worship experiences. So we will now be worshiping in person every first Sunday and every third Sunday, every first Sunday and every third Sunday. Y'all, I'm excited when I mentioned it, when I announced it in service, we got a round of applause and my prayer is that you are applauding as I am saying this right now. And not only are you applauding, but you are going to decide to come to church in person every first and third Sunday. Same time, 10 a.m., we'll be at the same location we've been worshiping at, at 5240 Panola Industrial Boulevard, Stonecrest, Georgia, 30035. So we'll be there uh, every first and third Sunday. So that means every second and fourth Sunday, we will be virtual. So we'll still be virtual every second and fourth Sunday. But every first and third Sunday, we will be in person. I know you're going to be like, oh, Lord, I got to remember that. Well, put it in your calendar. Number one, go ahead and make it repeat. First and third in person, second and fourth virtual. But here's also a cool thing that we also announced. Every fifth Sunday, we're going to come together and worship through service. We're going to go out and give back to the community every fifth Sunday at 10 a.m., the same time we would be worshiping in person or a virtual as well. And y'all, that's a, that's a risk, right? Because churches want to be in service, whether it's virtual or in person every Sunday. But on the fifth Sunday, we are going to uh, love God, but we're also going to tangibly express our love for our neighbor, for our brothers and sisters as well. So every fifth Sunday, uh, we will be worshiping through our service to our brothers and sisters. I'm super excited about that, you all. Uh, I'm excited about this new rhythm of worship for us as well. I know I've been announcing all of that, and my prayer is that you've already been putting it in your calendar. First and third in person, second and fourth virtual, fifth Sunday worship through service. Um, but you'll be getting uh, announcements, emails, text messages, social media posts, all that good stuff to just remind you as well. Okay. All right, y'all. Well, let's jump into our word. Y'all, we are coming to the conclusion of our uh, message series. I didn't preach uh, this past Sunday because First Lady preached her off. She preached her. She preached, y'all. <laughs> she preached, she preached and really delivered a mighty, mighty word. She was so nervous about the word that she had. And I told her, babe, look, Typically, when you struggle like that, it's because God really has something to say. And God spoke really, really powerfully through her. So if you were, were not at service or didn't see it virtual, good thing is you can always go through our YouTube channel. Just uh, if you're not watching this on YouTube, you just go to our channel, Transforming Faith Church channel, and find this past Sunday's uh, worship experience. Okay? All right, y'all. Again, we are concluded. Well, not concluding yet, we're on our road to concluding this message series, Why the Church? 
and uh, been preaching about it, but also teaching uh, during these moments in Bible study as well. And we're going to continue that. Uh, I'm excited because I'm going to continue teaching on uh, the church, why the church in this uh, uh, study this Wednesday. And then next Sunday, I'll be concluding the preaching part of it. And then we'll finally um, close out on next Wednesday with a kind of a discussion and dialogue with our pastoral team on why the church. So just kind of keep that in your mind. Next Wednesday, we're going to have our, our pastoral team coming together uh, to talk about what the word says, what the church means to us individually, to answer any questions that you all may have about the church that we may be able to answer uh, during our time. All right. So why the church? Let's go to God in prayer real quick before we jump into the word. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Bible. Um, thank you for your son, Jesus, who pointed us to you in all things, God, who led us uh, to the road where we could live eternally with you, God. God, I thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. And through that sacrifice, we now have the right to live with you eternally. We say thank you. Thank you for this word. Thank you for the Bible. God, thank you for it, um, giving us more clarity on who you are, your characteristics, and even your plan for our life and how we ought to live while here on. Be with us during our time, Holy Spirit. You increase, I decrease. And I pray that your people will hear what you have to say through your word. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all. All right. Well, welcome you all. We see y'all coming in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I don't do this much during Bible study, but sometimes we'll put them in the links. Y'all, if you ever feel the desire to give while during Bible study, uh, our links, they should be popping up now uh, in our chats and all the different uh, areas is, is popping up. If you're watching this on our uh, website live, just go to uh, the website that you're on, transformingfaithchurch.com and click the contribute button and uh, continue down that path. Click, keep clicking contribute. And yes, I want to give. And then you could give that way as well. All right, y'all. Why the church? Why the church? Well, y'all, uh, just a, a quick recap. We have gone down this series really as a, a connection point to the sacrifice of Jesus. So we really picked this message up uh, after Easter, um, after Easter. And I just felt like it was a natural connection to uh, our celebrating and acknowledging the sacrifice of Jesus, but also the resurrection of Jesus. And through that sacrificial act, through the resurrection, we now have the right to live eternally with God because Jesus paid the price for our sins, right? So he got up and when he got up, uh, he actually spent some time with his disciples uh, for about 40 days here on earth. Again, after he was resurrected, he he showed himself to many of the disciples and followers and kind of gave them his parting instructions, his parting wisdom. In Matthew 28, um, he commissions the disciples. We call it the Great Commission. He tells them to go ye therefore, um, making uh, disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them all the things that I've instructed you to do. That's what Jesus was saying to the disciples, Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. And uh, and that was his charge, his commissioning act to his disciples to go you there for. Well, uh, in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, in the first chapter, uh, Jesus, af after he had finished um, showing and talking to the disciples, he gave them a command. He told them to um, go to Jerusalem and just hang there. Uh, don't go far from Jerusalem. Stay in Jerusalem because... I will send the Holy Spirit to you. Now, Jesus, uh, previously in the book of John, and I think uh, maybe another uh, gospel, told them, you know, prior to his departing uh, this earth, prior to his death, he told them, look, I'm not going to leave you. Uh, I'm not going to leave you or forsake you, but I got to go from this place. And when I go, he promised them a helper, an advocate, and that was the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised them that he would send the Holy Spirit that would give them power in their um, time of need and to do what God had called and charged for them to do. And so as Jesus uh, in the book of Acts uh, reminded the disciples, remember he had he had uh, died, he had resurrected himself and uh, and he began to show himself 
to the disciples. As he finished saying what he had to say with the disciples to finally leave the earth for good, he tells them, he tells them, he says, uh, I'm about to leave the earth. But but before I, but after I leave, he's saying, go and I will show you um, Acts chapter one, verse eight. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Jesus was telling them, look, you'll receive this promise, the power uh, of the Holy Spirit. And that power, the Holy Spirit, will uh, allow you to be witnesses to me at Jerusalem, that's home. Judea, that's a little further out. And Samaria, that's even further. And to the end of the earth. It's like Jesus was saying, look, if you live in in DeKalb like me, right? I'll, I'll, I'll give you power to be a witness in DeKalb, right? In, uh, in Georgia, in the United States, and throughout the rest of the earth, the rest of the world. So Jesus was saying, look, I'm giving you power to do, the Holy Spirit will give you power to do some big things. And then the next verse, Acts 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 9, it says, now when he has spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Jesus, after he gave them this last command, was taken up. He was taken up uh, uh, up, and, and, and a cloud received him. So now Jesus is gone. He's gone. But Jesus, remember, Jesus had left them this promise. He had left them this promise that he would not leave them or forsake them. And so if you continue in Acts chapter 2, remember, he told the disciples um, I want you to go to Jerusalem and stay there and uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will receive power. We're in Acts chapter two, verse one, it says this, and we're going to read a few verses here. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. This was like Jesus commanded, right? Verse two. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Y'all, they had received power, this power that Jesus told them that they would receive. They would receive power, the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the power of the Holy Spirit was not necessarily the tongue talking. Y'all know it was miraculous. They were talking in languages that they had never learned or even had been exposed to. But it was more of this outward expression of God's power in their life. So remember, Jesus said in, in verse 8, he says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So we see when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in Jerusalem in the upper room, right, that uh, that's exactly what happened. They received power and this power allowed them to, um, uh, to, to do things that they couldn't do within their own power. They were able to, in that moment, talk in other languages that they weren't even controlling. They were literally other languages that other people um, spoke, but not themselves. And that power uh, that they received um, came in what we would understand to be the first church and the first church service, right? God had transformed that room that they were in into a, 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 a church experience. Now, so let's keep reading so you can understand why. We're going to go down uh, further in Acts chapter 2. Uh, further down in Acts chapter 2. And we see that in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 40. Let's start reading. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them. Now, I, I, because we skipped over some verses, what happened after the uh, Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and after they began talking in other tongues, uh, other languages, people got confused. They thought they were drunk. Uh, what they've been doing. This is this is weird. We haven't experienced something like this before. And then Peter stands up and begins to clarify what was going on. He was like, Peter told them. I'm not going to go into that because it's about 20 to 30 verses right there. But but Peter stands up and begins to 
uh, preach, essentially. I don't know that they understood that to be preaching, but this is was actually the very first preaching moment uh, in the world, right? This is the first preaching moment in this uh, new thing called the church. So let me start over again in verse 40, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 40. And with many other words, Peter, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Peter had been preaching. Peter was preaching. Now, what I want to give you, uh, let you know is from here on out, I'm going to be showing you various elements that we experience in the modern day church. I'm going to connect what we saw in the early church, what we're, what we're reading in Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to connect that to what we even see and experience in this new modern church. Because some of us say, well, I don't understand why we do all what we do. I don't understand why we got to come to the church building. I don't understand why we got all that singing and preaching and, and, and reading the Bible and praying and all that other good stuff. Well, what I want to do is remember the message series is entitled why the church, I want to bring some clarity as to, you know, where it comes from. Because if you can understand that it didn't, it, it isn't just something that was just made up. If you understand that this wasn't just a bright idea, if you understand that this just, just wasn't some concoction that somebody made in the back room, but this is actually something that is biblical that we can point to in the Bible, I think you'll feel a little bit better about what we uh, experience in the church. And it is connected to Jesus, right? Because so many times people say, well, I don't really fool with the church. I'm a spiritual person and I'm, I'm going to just do my thing, me and Jesus, me and God, you know, and all of that. And you ought to have that as well. As a matter of fact, um, on Sunday, I'm going to talk some about that, right? The title of this Sunday's message is uh, continue the, this message series, Why the Church? But uh, the subtitle is, it's the inside outside game the inside outside game. And, uh, and I, I won't even go too further than that, but just check us out on this Sunday at 10 a.m. All right. So, um, the first preaching moment, the first sermon ever delivered, uh, in the Christian church, as we know it was right here in Acts chapter two, and it was delivered by Peter. So we see that preaching was in the church because remember, this is the first church and the first church service, uh, uh, essentially in Acts chapter two. So let's keep reading. Verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So Peter preached. You know, he finished up his message in verse 40. Remember, there were a bunch of verses before that. So you want to want to know why some messages or some sermons go so long? Well, Peter, Peter looked like he preached a long message uh, in there, all those verses. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. But um, he preached and then there was a response, right? Verse 41 says, then those who gladly received his word, right? The, the word of Peter, the, the preached word, the sermon of Peter. So there was a response, you know, in the church, you know, at the end of service. And it doesn't necessarily have to be at the end. But it, but if you're talking about a call, the message to preach the sermon and a response, you know, you got to be the call or the preach sermon first. So. Uh, here in verse 41, the people responded. They received the word. Uh, and then it says they were baptized. Now, baptized means uh, in the Greek, it's it's baptizo. That's the Greek word. And it essentially means to be drowned, to dunk. Um, but really, it's more it's 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 more about what it represents than the actual um, um, instance of what's going on. It, it represents you going in the water, right, as one person, but you're coming up out of the water, uh, no longer uh, being the person you were before you went into the water. You're now representing Christ. You're different before the water than after the water. And so the baptism, because Jesus told his disciples, go make disciples. And then he told them to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. The son is Jesus. So when you're baptizing them, it's representing that you are now changing from who you were being so selfish and, and isolated and focused on yourself. And now you're saying my life is no longer my own. 
my life is now dedicated and given over to Jesus. So there was a response uh, both in receiving the word, but also there was a response in being baptized. And then it says 3,000 souls were added to them. A whole lot of people heard this good word and they responded and they said, yes, I want Jesus, right? Let's keep reading. Verse 42. So in verse 40, we have preaching. Verse 41, we have a response and baptism, right? Verse 42, let's read this. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So in this one verse, in verse 42, a number of things are happening here. So now we're continuing. And remember, Jesus said in Matthew 28, um, 19 and 20, he tells them, after he tells them to go make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he says, teach them all that I have instructed you to do. So right here in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, um, they are doing what Jesus told them to do. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The apostles' doctrine was them teaching what Jesus taught them, right? So they essentially, if you want to modernize it to what we do today, they were reading the Bible. They study the Bible, right? Because we're reading the words of Jesus and what Jesus instructed as well, particularly in the New Testament. Uh, and so they simply study the Bible. Excuse me, I just keep uh, checking uh, the time to make sure I'm not going over too much, right? So they studied the Bible uh, and uh, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship uh, in the breaking of bread. Well, Jesus um, instituted uh, the Holy Communion. Uh, he instituted Holy Communion uh, at the Last Supper um, uh, right before uh, he would uh, be headed to his death, right? And so he told them to do this often in remembrance of, of me, in remembrance of what he did in his sacrifice. And so they continued doing that in the breaking of bread, in the communion, in the Lord's Supper, uh, what you see is a breaking of bread and the giving of wine, the bread representing his body and the wine representing his blood. And so communion is represented here in the first church service uh, in the Bible. And then in prayers, y'all know we, we pray, we communicate to God, we thank God, we we ask God for what we need, we, we focus our mind and attention on God. And so right here in verse 42, we see in the first church and the first church service, right? We see studying of the Bible. We see communion and we see prayer, right? All right, verse 43. My phone just keeps buzzing. Uh, somebody sending me a text and I think it's my children. Verse 43, uh, it says this. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Remember, Jesus said, go to Jerusalem. Uh, wait on the Holy Spirit and you will receive power, right? So they received this power. The first expression of that power was them speaking in tongues, but that was not the only expression of that power. There were other uh, expressions of that power. In verse 43, it says there were wonders and signs done through the apostles. People were getting healed, y'all. People who were blind could see. People who were deaf could hear. There were people being, their lives were being changed all because they received the Holy Spirit. And when they received the Holy Spirit, power was given to them by the power of of the Holy Spirit. You got that? So uh, in the midst of their church service, there were signs, wonders, miracles. There was power in the midst of their worship experience. In many churches around the world, there are still signs and wonders, miracles that are, are experienced as a result of them being together uh, in unity, in worship, and, uh, and we still believe in that. We believe that signs, wonders, and miracles can and should be done in the midst of us coming together in worship. Verse 44. Verse 44 says this. Now all who believe were together and all, had all things in common. Right? They were together. Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem. Stay there. I'm sure not everybody was obedient, right? And can you imagine you being one of those who Jesus told to go and you went, 
but you couldn't you couldn't stay long. You got you got distracted. You started thinking about other responsibilities, other things you could be doing because you didn't fully understand or believe that a change was going to come or something special was going to happen. Uh, and so, but but it says here in verse forty four. Now all who believe were together and had all things in common. And these people were the people that stayed, right? They stayed here because they believed in what Jesus said. They believed that their lives were going to be transformed. They believed that power was going to show up as a result of the Holy Spirit that was promised. They believed and they came together. See, the, one of the attributes of the church is that people come together. It's a good thing, you all, for people to come together and worship. That's what God desires. It's a good thing, y'all. And I know, and I talked about this at the very beginning. Some people say, well, I just, I don't really do church. I don't really fool with church and all that. What they're really saying is they don't want to fool with people. They don't really do people you know, for various reasons. Because when you deal with people, uh, you get lied, you know, lied to, lied on, you you know, issues arise, drama arises, and people think just because it's the church that people uh, miraculously are perfect, and that's not a reality. People do wrong. People uh, act shady, and, or there's some just uh, disconnect. There's debates. There's arguments. People don't see eye to eye on things, and that's the reality of people engaging and doing life together. But I'm here to tell you that the church, remember this, is God's idea. The church is God's idea, which means it's good. It's good for us to come together as he commanded. It's good for us to do what um, the author of Hebrews said in, in, in Hebrews chapter 10. He says in verse 24, and let us consider uh, one another in order to stir up love and good, get good works. Verse 25 says it's not forsaking the assembling or the gathering of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. The author of Hebrews says, look, don't forsake us coming together. You know, don't. I know you're dealing with people, but here's the reality. Uh, you keep going back to your job. Oh, I get it. See, you say, oh, I go back to my job because I got to work, right? Because I got to eat, right? And I got to get paid in order to eat and, you know, and all of that. Well, that's because you see the benefits of enduring the challenge and the struggles on your job. And what I want you to see is that there are benefits with, with showing up, with gathering together in the Lord's name through the church. There are benefits. Now, you may not be getting paid, but there are greater benefits than money. You, you know, there, there are greater benefits to your life than money. And I need you to see those benefits and, and understand that because the church is God's idea, he wants us there together in unity. Uh, so let's finish reading uh, uh, at our time for uh, today. Acts chapter 2 still. Verse 44 again says, Now all who believe were together and had all things in common. Verse 45. And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Y'all know what that's called? It's called benevolence. Benevolence. In most churches, uh, and definitely in the United States of America, but very likely around the world, there's something called benevolence. Benevolence is when people are in need, the church will show up as it can to help them. You know, that's something that we at Transforming Faith Church work to do. We, we are very intentional about it. That when people have a need, you know, you're about to be evicted or you, your light is about to be, your power is about to be cut off or, you know, just whatever. You have some challenges and sometimes it's not all a monetary for us. It's just particularly with me because God has allowed me to have so many, many relationships with people that can make decisions on people's behalf. That sometimes it's just me showing up, taking my time, using, utilizing my time to benefit someone but in verse 45, when they sold their possessions and goods, they divided them among all as anyone had need. That was them being benevolent. We would call that at TFC generosity, right? Y'all know our saying, pound for pound, we will be one of the most generous churches around. That's our way of saying pound for pound, we'll be one of the most benevolent uh, 
uh, churches around. That's just a tangible way of expressing our love for our neighbor. So y'all, I'm, I'm here to tell you, maybe you've never looked at uh, the Bible this way or even in the book of Acts relative to the church, but in the church, you'll see many of these attributes here. You'll see preaching, you'll see a response that's an action taken, whether it's people uh, receiving Christ through salvation or joining our church uh, through membership, or maybe them uh, as a result of them hearing the preached word and, and being moved by God, making a decision uh, uh, for their life, a decision to help people, even a decision to change directions or path in their life. There's baptism there. Periodically, we'll baptize people uh, who have come to know Christ and want to, um, in a very outward way, uh, express their new uh, change in their new life. There's studying of the words, studying of the Bible, reading of the Bible here. There's communion, us partaking of the Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread and the giving of wine or juice as we do uh, in uh, in our church. There's prayer. We pray not, uh, a lot. We pray at the beginning of service. We pray in the middle of service. We pray at the end of service. I prayed at the beginning of this Bible study as well. There's power that's received uh, and to allow you to do things, to, to make a difference in people's lives, to help people, to transform. There's us coming together. Well, we're coming together in person or even virtually. We're still coming together, even though it's through a screen. When we're showing up in the same on the same social media page or the same website, we're coming together. There's us coming together, forsaking not the gathering or the assembly of ourselves together. There's benevolence. There's helping people who are in need. Those who have are are are, in, are, are intent about helping those in need. All the things that I've just recounted here are all in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. So if you ever ask yourself, well, why do we do this? Or we don't need to do that. It doesn't take all that. Well, it took all that to, to launch the church. And the church is God's idea. And and what we see in Acts chapter 2, and and uh, it, we, we can connect back to what Jesus commanded of the disciples as well. So I don't want to take our church worship experience for granted. I don't want us to just think we can do life on our own, just me and God. Well, he didn't build us for that. He didn't create us uh, for that. And and I may be challenging some of you all right now, but I'm going to tell you that is not pleasing God. If that is the tact that you have taken, it's not. Yes, he loves for you to come and worship him and pray to him and, and do all that. But he also built us to live in community, to do life with one another in a very intentional way. He wants us to come together in worship as well. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all. Well, that's it for our time. Uh, that's it for our Bible study time uh, on this evening. Prayerfully, you can, you've had some very tangible things that you can answer the question, why the church? Remember, why the church? Because it's God's idea. Y'all, again, I'm excited about this Sunday. Y'all, make sure you tune in. We're worshiping uh, virtually again, we'll be worshiping virtually for the remainder of May, and then we'll come back uh, and worship in person on the first Sunday in June. But for this upcoming Sunday, we'll be virtual. Uh, we'll be concluding the preaching portion of the series, Why the Church, uh, and the subtitle of Sunday's message will be the Inside Outside Game for you sports fans right there. If you're not a sports fan, I'll help uh, give you some understanding of what we mean by that. All right, y'all. Well, that's our time for this evening. Uh, let's close out in prayer. And then my prayer is that you have an awesome, awesome remainder of your evening. God, we are so thankful that you have uh, shown us your word, that you've given us your word, God. God, I'm so thankful that we can get clarity of who you are and what you desire, what your plans are for us. God, I'm thankful that you even show us what the church ought to look like through your word. God, I pray that um, that we would have clearer understanding, that our, our hearts will be open, our ears, our eyes will be uh, open to hear what you have to say. And we would use your word um, as a transformational um, process in our life. God, we love you. We honor you. Bless those who have joined us um, this evening and who haven't as well. Touch their lives. Let them, let them see you in a new and a refreshing way. We love you so much. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
and amen. All right, y'all, go in peace, and we will see you this Sunday at 10 a.m. on our virtual worship service. God bless you all.